Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Belinda Kroll. Yes, we do. It was a yeah. great interview. Yeah, we had a really good time talking with Belinda. She's yeah. uh, writing Cozy Fantasy, mm-hmm. and we haven't had a lot of people on to talk about that. So that was fun to, to kind of delve into that subcategory and what those books are about. Right. And she is just like one of the busiest people, I think, but very productive. I mean, she just has so many things going on. Yeah. She does, but she is, yeah, she's a energizer bunny for sure. <laughs> yeah. She's got little yeah. kids and then she's, you know, but she's She still- works full time and yeah. she's writing part time intentionally because she said yeah. she wants writing to be like her fun escape. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So it's her, uh, she called it her joyful side hustle, which yeah. I loved. Yeah. Love that And too. she does a planner. She does all kinds of things. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's coming up in a little bit, but, um. So first, we should say we have a sponsor again for the podcast. It's brought to you by Vellum this week, and we'll get into more of that in a little bit. But um, what have you got going on this week, Jamie? Uh, Well, this week, I am teaching swimming lessons at my daughter's house. And um, like I did last year, last year, um, you know, it was to have a little extra money this year. It's to continue to live the lifestyle I have grown accustomed (laughs) to. to. (laughs) But you know what? I'm not embarrassed by that uh, because here's the deal. We all got to do things sometimes. And I actually Mm -hmm. love swimming lessons. Uh, They're fun for me. Uh, I I like the joy I get of seeing Mm -hmm. a kid swim. But you know what? I may have to do something at some point that I don't enjoy as much, (laughs) but if I can do that, like on a real short-term level and continue to do my writing Mm -hmm. um, such that it is now, um, then, then I'm willing to do that. And I think if we all kind of held that full-time author and full-time author only thing a little more loosely, loosely, Mm -hmm. uh, we might be a a lot more happy. So yeah. Yeah. For what it's worth, you know, take it or leave it. But anyway, yeah. so that's what I'm doing. Uh, I realized when I got in the pool um, on Monday that I, because my sister had started to get, you know, sicker around this time last year that I'd done a lot of praying in that pool. And yeah. I was a little worried that I would, it would kind of trigger some stuff, but it hasn't and it's mm-hmm. been fine. So I'm, that's good. Okay. That's good to hear that it's still a good yeah, good place for you. Good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this is a good match for this episode because yeah. we do talk about like wanting writing to have that, bring you that joy. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's better to not have it be your full-time right. thing. Right. And sometimes we need a break to go do something else. Right. So right. yeah. Or to heal or yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, what yeah. about you? What's been going on with you? Um, well, I'm also like not doing my normal thing. I've been to visit my family, went to a wedding, a family yeah. wedding. Um, it was great. Great to see everybody. The wedding was beautiful. I saw uh, cousins and stuff that I haven't seen for like over 30 years. It was great. So fun. Yeah. 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 So it was a good time. And so, yeah, I'm doing no writing this week. I'm trying to get that done and then have some other travel coming up. So not worrying about it. We're just, you know, taking a little summer break. So that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. But uh we have some new sponsors, don't we? We do. We have some new supporters, supporters this week. Not sponsors, yeah. <laughs> so we have people listeners who are supporting the podcast and mm-hmm. we're so thankful and grateful for that. So we've got uh two supporters this week. Lavender mm-hmm. picked the unicorn is her emoji. And Love that. Yeah. And Emily picked, I think it's a little cat. It's the yellow cat. And uh, it's just very cute. So thank you to both of those supporters and everybody else who has been supporting the show. We just appreciate it. And it shows us that, that you want the show to keep going and that you enjoy it too. And you find it valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes us doing what we do so much more fun and easy. Um, And so we appreciate it. 
Yes. So this week we also have an industry supporter, Vellum, and yeah. we love Vellum. They're like one of our favorite author products. So this week, should we talk about like how I use Vellum for the Kickstarter? I, I think, think that would, we should. I think yeah. We should. Yeah. Vellum is just so easy to use. And I knew I would use uh, Vellum for the interior on my regular books. But when I was doing the Kickstarter, I was trying to think of ways to make it a little more special. Right. And I thought, oh, I don't really, I was kind of on a deadline. I didn't really have a whole lot of time. And so I thought, well, what can I do with Vellum? And I went and looked and I realized I could change up the page facing, like if, if each chapter begins on the right-hand side of the book, each left-hand side page would be blank. And I was like, maybe I could put something on there. Right. And so I found a graphic that kind of is an art deco looking pattern. And I put that in on every page mm-hmm. and uh, I did it the hard way, of course, because I didn't realize that vellum actually makes it a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> they do have a way to go in and you can do a full page bleed on either just above your chapter head or on the chapter head and on the facing page. It's very cool. Yeah. So they have all kinds of special things like that. So I use that and I added color, like I use them to create the PDF and then I added color images to the PDF because that was one of the stretch uh, goals yeah. that we hit. So I, I added a color chapter heading. Right. Yeah. So I've just, I've used it for the Kickstarter and was really happy with it, how it turned out. And they have way more options than I ever use. You have customization that you can do yep. in there that I yep. usually don't even mess around with, but you can customize a lot in there. Yep. So, so I highly recommend it. <laughs> it's a great tool. It's a great yep. tool. If you're a Mac user, it mm-hmm. is great for you and you can go in and you can like build your book and format mm-hmm. it and look at it and see how it looks and if you like it and that's all for free. And then you only, uh, purchase if you decide to go ahead and create that book Mm -hmm. Uh, you can try them out at vellum at try vellum.com backslash wish y'all know me i'm never gonna but i'm getting (laughs) i'm trying we're getting there (laughs) yeah so that's so i guess we should get on with the interview right yes we should yes all right so here's belinda today we are so happy to talk with belinda kroll hi belinda how are you Good. How are you? Uh, we're great. And we're so happy you're here. This is going to be fun. Me. Yeah. We're just really looking forward to digging into all that you do and just kind of figuring out, like hearing more about cozy fantasy and mm-hmm. just all the stuff you do with direct sales and things. So let me read your bio and we'll get to it. Belinda Kroll is an award-winning author of sweet and cozy Victorian rom- romanticy. Is that how you say it? That's how I say it. Okay, we have to see. I love it. <laughs> She's writing the Hesitant Medium series where women can speak with ghosts and wish they couldn't and the sweet men who love them. <laughs> Belinda is the mind behind the Bright Bird Press all-in-one novel planner and other forgiving stationery for discovery writers. That's awesome. I love the word discovery writers. <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> Panther always feels like... We don't know what we're to me at least. Yeah, yeah. Like feels like you're out of control. Like we don't know what yeah. we're doing, and we're yeah. just and that's kind of the point. Flying by the seat yeah. of our pants, but there's actually a lot of intuition. I think that happens yeah. behind the scenes for discovery writers. Right, right. Um, so that's I kind of went that direction with it. I love that. I love that. Well, tell us how you got into writing. I have always been a writer I have memories of being seven I'm one of those kids so like I was seven <laughs> years old and you know I had this story and I, I remember using this word I remember using the word ruler in my story and I was seven years old and my teacher was like you don't know what that word means and I was like sure I do it means a king or a queen and she thought I meant a mega oh, ruler yeah. uh-huh. and so she thought I was using the wrong word I'm like no 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 I'm writing a story about a king and a princess this is he's the ruler right and so that's um kind of the story of my life right like I just <laughs> I pick up words and people are like why do you even know that word and now you're using it in a story um so uh yeah so I've been doing it my entire life I went you know, the computer engineering route for undergrad. And then Uh I went into human computer interaction for grad school because I was convinced that writing isn't going to pay the bills. Um, And I'm glad that I did that because Uh I don't want writing to pay the bills. I want Uh writing to be my fun thing. Um, Mm -hmm. And that this is a, this is a joyful side hustle for me. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of, 
it was always, it's just, it's a compulsion for me. I, I, I joke with my husband, I have two cycles. And one of them is if I haven't written long enough, I get the same sort of hangry and upset yeah. as, um, <laughs> as, you know, as other people with other things that just like feed their soul. So, yeah, yeah. that's great. Well, yeah. you know what I, I, um, love that you said you don't want writing to pay your bills. I mean, I, think about that a lot. Uh, It does put a lot of pressure on your writing. And, you know, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert and Big Magic uh, talks about that. And I just think we don't think about that enough because, you know, being a full-time writer is kind of the goal for a lot of people. And it might not suit your personality, you know. Personality, your home life. I I don't think it's ever been a I think it's a retirement goal for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Someone had joked that with my direct sales, the way I was talking about it, it sounded like I was building up like a 401k. And I was sort of <laughs> like, you know what? Kind it's of like kind I want to be like a full-time that. Yeah. writer when yeah. I'm retired. But in the right. meantime, I want health insurance that I don't have to think about. And I yeah. Yeah. I want to be able to like su- support the kids through their school activities mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. all sorts of things. So there's just a mm-hmm. there have a lot of expenses. Mm-hmm. That I don't want to have to think about. So let's mm-hmm. keep the day job mm-hmm. and we'll do this thing on the side. Yeah. It. Yeah. I think like there are a lot of writers that come to writing later in life mm-hmm. and it is a, like retirement years are a great time to be a writer because yeah. you can set your own schedule and, you know, and hopefully you have income coming in from your retirement, you know, 401k or whatever. And then if you can add to it with writing, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And I love how you called it a joyful side hustle. Because sometimes we think of side hustles as like, oh, it's just got to get in there and do the work. And it's like so hard. But if it can be joyful, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of leads to our next question. Um, What is your definition of success? I I do think my definition of success is one, am I still having fun? Mm. Um, I... I'm definitely that millennial generation, the part of the generation where it's like, I feel like my hobbies need to be making money for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. I've been, I've been doing, so I published my first book in 2003, actually, oh, um, wow. through a vanity press. Oh, yeah. And then, in, you know, um, so that was an experience that certainly taught me a lot. And then in <laughs> 2010, I did a full indie publishing and I've been doing it since then, but mm-hmm. um but yeah, there's there's something to be said for, um, for me, my success is, am I having fun? Is it filling the well? Um, and if it's not filling the well, then like, what am I doing wrong? Right. Mm-hmm. So like my newsletter, I dreaded writing my newsletter, even though I was only doing it once a month. Right. And so I was like, what am I doing wrong? And so I um, started following all these other author newsletters and then I picked the parts that I loved. And then I made a basically made a script or a template for myself. Every month I do this and this and this. And these are the three parts of my newsletter. And now I have mm-hmm. so much fun with it. Yeah. Right. So I so to me, definition of success is having fun um, and learning and challenging because I'm a perpetual learner. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you know Strengths Finder or anything, but like yeah, yeah. is mm-hmm. number one for me. Oh well. <laughs> Um, so that I don't think I could ever be anything but a discovery writer because of the fact that intellection is so high. Uh-huh. Um, so, so yeah, if I, I want to learn, I want to, uh, enjoy the learning and I want to be able to apply the learning. Um, and so I think that those are all very important things to me. And then also at the end of the day, it's about the readers. So are they having fun with it too? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm having a lot of fun writing. Are they having fun reading? Um, so it is a mutual, you know, sort of a codependent relationship there. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's really where I like to live. That's yeah. great. I think that's fantastic. I'm also a number one intellection, so I totally understand that. But um, I think it's interesting that you that you described how you changed your your newsletter routine, like mm-hmm. by following other people, and then you gave yourself some structure, which can mm-hmm. really help with like ah, I don't know what else to write. So you got ideas, gave yourself structure, and then you use the word fun quite a bit. So Mm -hmm. I think that's so, obviously, that's so important to you. And then because it's important to you, you'll pass that along to your readers. So I think that's just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely the goal. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what do you wish you'd known about writing in craft when you started? I think, so, so that book from 2003. 
Um, that was actually my, I'm going to date myself. It was my high school senior thesis. Oh, okay. And uh, my dad helped me like, you know, find this, um, this company. It was, they were called Aventine Press. They may still be around. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, at the time I had written that book like seven times already by oh, the time wow. I had published it. I, I started in like sixth grade or something. Oh, wow. Um, and I was obsessed with the civil war and I wanted to do this like epic romantic drama, but I still have it feel really sweet because I didn't know any better. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I was trying to do things like have motifs, yeah. right. Cause I felt like I needed it to be important writing uh-huh. and I'm a genre writer and genre writing is important too, like in and of itself. Yes. And so I wish I had one, I think back then there weren't as there weren't as many craft books that spoke to me in the same way. Um, like now I think it's, um, is it Gwen Hayes romancing the beat? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, like I found her book and it like changed my world. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and it's short and it's sweet and it's to the point and gets me exactly what I need, but it's also so flexible yeah. that, mm-hmm. you know, I was able to go into a draft that was halfway through. I was able to cut 30,000 words re-outlined like re took like new index cards based on romancing the beat rearranged scenes and all of a sudden I was like oh oh here we are oh okay I get it (laughs) you know and so I think because intellection is so high for me because I'm such a my discovery writing is my comfort zone Mm -hmm. I think things that I wish I understood were one like I don't have to go like the literary route Mm -hmm. but also don't be afraid of some form of structure, like similar with the newsletter. I was trying to just wing it every single month. And that was causing me so much stress Mm -hmm. where I think having guidelines and knowing I can break them if I want to, because Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, this is my writing. Sure. But having that ability to say, I have this guideline, I don't need to reinvent the wheel, but I can make this unique to me and to my characters and to my story. Mm -hmm. And that can also save me a lot of time because, you know, now, you know, when I was writing back in 2010, I was still single. Mm -hmm. I had just come out of grad school. So I was used to just like holding in a room somewhere and not talking to anyone for a couple of days. You know, now I have a house. I have a full-time job. I have a Mm -hmm. husband and kids. Um, There's a lot of demands on my time. Right. And they're good demands, but Mm -hmm. I need to be more efficient. And so I think that's the other thing is like, how do I stay efficient? Um, even as I'm having fun with things. So that definitely is a huge factor for me with the craft of writing is Mm -hmm. how do I keep it fun? How do I keep it as low pressure as possible? But then how do I also be as efficient with my time? Mm -hmm. Um, Knowing that like, I'm going to be in my brain a lot and that's okay. Like, Mm -hmm. I think that took a long time for me to realize like it is okay to be in your brain and not put pen to paper because when I do put pen to paper, I'll like spit out 3000 words when it finally mm-hmm. happens. So mm-hmm. I just have to trust that process. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's so funny. Two things. One, Romance in the Beats, I use it as an editing tool more than I use it as a plotting tool. Because I don't yeah. really, I don't really, I, I'm, I usually know the beginning, the middle and the end. Yeah. And so then I write a discovery right to those places. But then when I'm finished with the first draft, I'll look at Romance in the Beats and say, kind of like you, where did I hit those marks? And if I didn't add them in or rearrange them, because maybe I hit them, I just hit them in the wrong place. And so, um, yeah, I, for me, that's how I use it. And then, um, what was the second thing? I can't remember. Um, (laughs) yeah, I don't know, but the the biggest thing is Gwen Hayes' book, Romancing the Beats, go get it. It's great. (laughs) So it is. (laughs) And again, it's short and it's to the point. Yes, it is. It's really accessible. Okay. Yeah. 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 I love nonfiction that's like, this is what you need. Here it is. Mm -hmm. I'm done. (laughs) I don't want all the extra stuff. I remember the second thing. I remembered it. Yeah. You know, it just takes me a minute. Uh, Yesterday we were at lunch and my husband kept saying, "Why, why do you keep doing this? Like I was sort of staring off into space and I was I was sort of pointing, but I wasn't really pointing. I was just, and, uh, but I was moving my hand a little bit. And I was thinking about my book, you know, I mean, I was thinking of, I was like, oh, I'm just thinking about my story. Sorry. You know, like I just am in my head with it because I'm number 10 
an election. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, not as high as the two of you, but uh, still in my top 10. So, yeah. yeah. And it, it influences a lot. Yeah, so. it does. It does. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of like thinking that goes on, like figuring it out. And you're right. You don't always have to put it down on paper right away. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's better if you don't like right. you've got to like, I do less revision if I think more about my story before. Yeah. And there's other yeah. people who are completely opposite. So yeah. just everybody has their own process. Right. right. But um, what about marketing? Um, what do you wish you had known about marketing? Oh, I feel like I'm still in the middle of learning about marketing, but I do. I I feel like it's a similar thing where, oh, like this actually can be fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So first off, I focused, I used to be on like Facebook and Twitter and, you know, this and that and the other. And I was just spread so thin, Mm -hmm. not having fun, didn't know what I was supposed to be writing on these different platforms to make it interesting and compelling. Um, And then I honestly, I got Canva Pro and I realized, oh, well, so I was already using Canva to like do my front covers. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they started pushing the Canva Pro subscription. And then I realized they have a content calendar. And it's like, well, I'm already in there doing my book covers and other things for like interior images. Mm -hmm. Why don't I just get the pro version and then I can schedule content to Instagram? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I focused, I focused on my time in it because I love Instagram. I'm in there anyway, just for my Mm -hmm. personal accounts. Right. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to focus on Instagram. <clears throat> and then I discovered that they also compose to TikTok. Mm-hmm. So then I thought, all right, I'll do Instagram and TikTok. And um, TikTok, I'm really not as, <laughs> I, I'm not really not as much of a presence there. And I realized too, like in order for me to get views, I have to do like a 16 or like a 15 second video where it's just my face on top of like an image. So I'm like, so there's no mm-hmm. point in planning that. Like I'm just right. going to do that at whim. And, yeah. you know, people will find me if they want to find me because TikTok is very fluid uh, in that way. Mm-hmm. But Instagram, I again, I, I gave myself a schedule. And so I I try to schedule, I'll, I'll take like an afternoon, the first Sunday of the month uh-huh. and I'll schedule four posts and it's going to be 2 p.m. every Thursday. And that way I know I have something going. And then if mm-hmm. I have other things that are just like, oh, I found a thing, or maybe I have an mm-hmm. Instagram story that's just right. then then that's just additional, you know, great. Like we're we're right. we're feeding the algorithm. Right. Um, and then we're also seeming organic. But like I oh, I'm trying to at least have something at the same day, at the same time. So that way the algorithm knows, like, oh, she's a regular poster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so like, then it'll start to anticipate, I don't know if it does or not, right? Like we talk about this algorithm, like it's a yeah. being, but, <laughs> but in my head, I'm like, the algorithm knows yeah, <laughs> and it's going to tell my followers, like she did a thing again. So, yeah. um, same, and same thing there is I started following one. I just started following authors that I love anyway, Yeah, but then I started paying attention to what they're doing and like, uh, what are the posts that are resonating with me? And can I mm-hmm. borrow that idea and shift it and change it mm-hmm. for my purpose? Right. And I think that has really helped because a lot of the marketing I was doing, I had to, I had to throw it all away because I was marketing to other writers. Mm, yeah. And that's where the confusing part was for me. Cause I technically do have two lines of, I'll call it my publishing business. Mm-hmm. I have this stationary for writers, mm-hmm. but then I have the readers mm-hmm. and I was that the line was too blurry between the two of them. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. shifting how to market to readers has been a difficult journey. And I think it's because the things that I thought were boring are actually really interesting to people, <laughs> especially if you, especially if you package it in a cute Canva graphic, right? Yeah. So like, yeah. I have this, I have this image on my profile where it's like a pie chart. Uh-huh. And the pie chart says like the Belinda Kroll brand. And it's uh-huh. like, he always falls first. Uh, or uh-huh. like edutainment, like, because it's, it's a little bit, I have history sprinkled in yeah. and it's enough to like tease you on if you want to go learn more, or you could just live in this like lightly historical world, right? right. And you don't have yeah. to go further than this. Right. Um, so it's stuff like that, right? Where it's like, how, again, like, how can I make the marketing fun? Because I think the fun is going to come through to right. my intended audience and my intended audience is here because they want to have fun. Like I am right, writing right. cozy fantasy. It is escapist 
fun. That is Mm -hmm. the whole point of it. It's not meant to be serious. So that I think has been a journey Mm -hmm. one to stop marketing to the wrong group of people. And then once I knew I was, once I knew that, how do I market to the right group of people and get the right energy through to them? And I'm still on that journey. I wouldn't, I don't think I'm there, but you know, I don't think anyone ever gets there because yeah. it's it's fluid too. I, I think that that's fluid sometimes because your audience does change over time. And uh, and then the ways we have, the vehicles by which we can mm-hmm. reach them change. And so I do think that we're always kind of on that journey uh, in my opinion. But um, so you're talking about on Canva Pro, you create your image and then you just upload straight from Canva Pro or schedule. You, yeah, you schedule it. Yeah. Oh, now great. the the gotcha with that is they don't the the connection between Canva Pro and Instagram doesn't allow um like you can do reels but you won't get like the trending audio um, because you're scheduling in advance, right? Yeah. yeah. Or um and so I I don't know whether the reels actually get a lot of traffic because you're not using their editor and yeah. I think they they know that. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. You also can't schedule carousels where you have the multiple images you can swipe through. Right. Um, and it seems like right now the algorithm is really favoring those. So I'm using oh. a different app. I think it's the simplified app. It's like simplified.app mm-hmm. is the URL for it. Where I be- <laughs> so that's like the that's like the little annoying part. It's like so if I want a carousel, I download all the images, I upload to Simplified, and then Simplified will post to Instagram. I'm not sure why different apps get different publishing rights, right? but right. it's yeah. still saving me time. And it's, it's, it's increasing the engagement because, you know, as you get someone scrolls past the first image, and if they scroll past your account again, they get the second image and then they get, mm-hmm. they might get curious. So they uh, might go through the whole thing. So yeah. the more the more swipes, the more time is spent looking at your content Uh or the algorithm thinks, oh, this person is engaging and wants to know more about what your account is doing. So, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a great, yeah, that's a great tip. And Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that like the learning not to market to writers and, and how to market to readers is like a learning curve that I think a lot of us have gone through. I remember being in a blog, a group blog, and it was for readers, but one time I went in, I looked at all the comments. And I was like, oh, these are all writers commenting on our post. Cause you know, we yeah. were all trying to share and help each other. Yeah. But then I was like, if we're just all sharing each other's content with other writers, is it doing any good? You know? Right. So that's like a, no, the answer is no. Yeah, <laughs> no, but it takes a while to go. Oh, wait, this is not. Yeah what right. I wanted to do. Right. I'm going down the wrong yeah. path. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally. Exactly. Well, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? So I'm, I'm trying to reframe mistakes as learning moments Correct. for myself. Uh-huh. So whether it's right or wrong, I definitely learned something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, you know, with the first, so I'll, I'll go, I won't go 2003 because that's like a whole can of worms, but like 2010, I published Haunting Miss Trentwood mm-hmm. and, you know, I listened to these podcasts and everyone's talking about, oh, I published back in 2014 and 2015 and that was the heyday. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like I published in 2010, it was the wild west. You could only yeah. do it through smash words at the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and I just threw my book out there. Yeah. I had it edited, you know, mm-hmm. so I, I had gone through that. Well, that's um, really great. You were ahead of the curve on that one. I would well, imagine. And I, you know, and so it's, it's, it's true. Um, I was ahead of the curve and it was such that there was, there was no content out there. So you could make money. Mm-hmm. Without like my cover was all wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. Like if I showed you my cover, it was basically just you know, uh, it was a, it was a woman that her hair down and she looks like she was in a Victorian nightgown and she's looking down and it looks like a Victorian thriller. Uh, and hmm. again, because at the time we didn't have the words to say, yes, right. 
chapter one is going to be a little bit creepy, like Buffy, the vampire style creepy. And mm-hmm. then we're going to go straight up silly the rest of this book. Like yeah. it is a silly story yeah. about a dad haunting his daughter, his right. adult daughter. He mm-hmm. wants her to like be married and get out of the house. And she's just like, why do you have so many opinions? But yes. like, how do you market that in 2010? Yeah. And, and honestly, I didn't need to, because there wasn't any other content out there. Right. So right. I was making money because people were just desperate to fill their e-readers at the time. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. So then as I'm going along and I'm realizing, oh, like this cover is terrible. Like this doesn't yeah. say anything about the book. Right. Or then, and then I did the other big thing where is I flipped genres. So then oh. I did a straight like young adult civil war slice of life story, uh-huh. which again was good. And that's my award-winning story. Uh But it's not where my heart is. Uh So now here I am six years later and I'm slowly flipping back because I finally have realized I can make Haunting Miss Trent with a series and this can be so much fun and so silly and so escapist. But so now I have to, I, I'm essentially starting over, right? Yeah. When when it comes mm-hmm. to building an audience, right. the audience that I had in 2010, they've moved on. It's been 13 years, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there are some people that maybe were like, oh, that, that lady's writing again. I wonder yeah. what she's doing, <laughs> right? Like that may happen. Um, you know, I had a Patreon that I had I'd thrown out there, but I didn't know what I was doing. I just thought, uh-huh. oh, like if people like me, they'll like throw some money my way, I guess. Yeah. Not like a tip yeah. jar. I'm yeah. trying to use Patreon like a tip jar because we didn't have things like Kofi back then or uh-huh. Buy Me a Coffee or these other platforms. Right. So it's so interesting. Even when I published my book, The Civil, The Young Adult Civil War in 2017, and then I kind of went dark because then I had my children, mm-hmm. the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was in the pandemic where I wrote a short story where I realized, oh, this short story is my bridge to making this 2010 book into a series Mm -hmm. Uh but it took my brain that long to figure it out I had tried to write a sequel to Haunting with Trentwood in 2012 couldn't do it I kept going back to that story I had the wrong characters I had the wrong people like this things weren't working out and so I think my mistake was in one trying to force it Mm -hmm. um and then because I couldn't force it then I flipped genres so it was good it kept me writing and I learned a lot with that book Mm-hmm. But now I'm coming back and now I'm trying to apply all the good learnings I got from all these other things I did, but let's focus it in one place. So people know what to expect from me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. And I, um, I mean, I just think those are lessons we learn along the way. I don't, I I agree. I don't think they're mistakes at all. I mean, you learned so much and I, I'm excited that you've kind of found your place. That's awesome. Well, you're having fun, which is yeah. your, your, your definition of success. So you're winning already. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Well, we've, you've already talked a lot about like things you've learned and how you've, um, how your writing and your marketing has kind of changed over time, but would you, is there something that you could say would be like the most important lesson you've learned or the biggest, um, change you've had to make in your thinking, either one of those. That is a great question. I think the biggest lesson that I've learned probably all revolves around where am I pointing my energy? Mm-hmm. Um, so if if I'm pointing my energy at something that is not furthering my goal, which is having fun writing and having a direct connection with my readers, then that's Mm -hmm. a waste of energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the thing that I just keep focusing on. I actually have a calendar on my wall that just, I just write big X's Mm -hmm. on each day where I did something that furthered my energy. Like, Mm -hmm. am I investing in the thing that I care about? And if I didn't, then that day doesn't get an X. But if it's something as small as I worked on, because I'm trying to like illustrate my, I want to do an exclusive hardcover through my direct Mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. And so I'm picking up my old drawing skills. And so I'm counting that. Like, did I do a drawing tutorial today? Because that's Mm going to further the exclusive uh, edition that I'm working on. Or did I listen to a podcast today? Like all those things count toward, Mm -hmm. did I put energy in the right place for this thing that I'm doing? And as long as I did one small thing that day, Mm -hmm. then good. 
Mm-hmm. And I think when I was really loosey goosey and just throwing things out there and saying, well, let's try this and that's fine. And then I right. just felt so, what was it like sheets to the wind? Like I was just all over the place. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, that was a very stressful and happy time for me. Mm-hmm. And I was doing it to myself. So I think yeah. that's where I, when I gave myself the space to take a step back and say, whoa, like, what are we doing here? Right. That's where that I think was my huge, my biggest learning moment. I think that's where everything turned around. And that actually happened for me, like during the pandemic, um, mm-hmm. cause I had thought, well, I'm stuck at home. I'm going to get so much writing done, but you know, I was also <laughs> pregnant with my second child yeah. and, and we were, we had our toddler with us and we're full-time remote at home. Hmm. And, and, and instead I lost all my time mm-hmm. and my energy was just focused on all the negative things that were happening in the world. Facebook was a very unhappy place at the time mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. I was seeing a lot of content coming through that really revealed stuff about people that I thought were the close friends and family that really yeah. was upsetting. And so I think that's when, and I've never been great at boundaries, I think, because my brain is very networked and it's, it's a very system way Mm -hmm. of thinking this Mm -hmm. relates to that and that relates to that and we're all interdependent on each other right and I I think that's where I learned the boundary and like this boundary Mm -hmm. for me is Mm -hmm. where are you putting that energy Yeah. yeah I think that's a great idea for people like me who do not ride every day um and for people who are high in election, because if you're doing something to further either your career or your energy in this career, then you need credit for that. You need to give Mm -hmm. your credit, yourself credit for that. And a lot of times what I'll do is just get down on myself because I haven't written in three days because I have to think about something. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I just think that's a fabulous idea. Everybody go get a calendar with a big Sharpie. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love your saying it all counts, which is mm-hmm. so true. And we discount a lot of the things that we do that yeah. move us forward. Yeah. If it's not like X or whatever, not like writing actual words or right. releasing a book or something. Yeah. Right. So let's talk about your cozy fantasies. It's a newish genre, but it's not really because you, you, <laughs> you know, you, published a book in 2010 that was in the genre. Uh, but what do you wish you'd known about writing that specific uh, genre? Yeah. So I think even within the book that I wrote in 2010, it changes tone. And that was the biggest critique that I got for the book is we start out and the chapter, the, the opening chapter there's, this isn't a spoiler. It's on the back cover even. The dad, the dad's ghost crawls out of the grave during his funeral. Mm. And I go into a level of detail for that description of him crawling out of the grave and her sort of horror of like, whoa, what is happening? Mm-hmm. That sets the story up for it being a horror, really. Mm-hmm. A mm-hmm. light horror, but still a mm-hmm. horror. Mm-hmm. But then... At, by the end of the chapter, you know, she's waking up from, she's like been sleeping for a couple of days and she wakes up and she's like, that was clearly a dream, right? That was just a nightmare. And he's like, oh, you didn't see me, eh? And so the end of the chapter is like, she's crawled up on her headboard, her uh-huh. nightgown's all bunched around her knees. And she's sort of like, oh, yeah. you know, it's like this little giggle scream that she mm-hmm. has. And, mm-hmm. and so the tone flips mm-hmm. even in the first chapter. And right. so I break my promise to the reader. Uh, right. Uh-huh. And So cozy fantasy definitely balances on this line of, and I think there are a lot of debates about cozy fantasy as well. You know, I go on Reddit and, you know, it's it's about the vibes. You need Mm -hmm. to be feeling good the whole Mm -hmm. way through. You need to know that even if the stakes are high, because cozy fantasy, um, like Travis Baldry's Legends and Lattes, he, I think his tagline is like low stakes and high, high fantasy, low stakes or something like that. (laughs) Um, And like, for me, my definition of cozy fantasy is it's a lot of slice of life stuff. These Uh stories are actually very small. Uh My, um, I, my inspiration comes from Sailor Moon and Uh Pride and Prejudice and Charmed and Buffy and uh, you know, those, those those shows and books 
that are focusing on the lives of people and their romances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we happen to have fantasy too. We're in a magical world where we don't question things. Right. um, Like floating books and, you know, whatever. And so I think for me, it's finding like, what's your slice within that fantasy genre where the the cozy is what makes it cozy fantasy. So what about your story is cozy Mm -hmm. in the same way that like a cozy mystery has rules we're learning those rules as we go i think mm-hmm. for cozy fantasy cozy mystery the way i understand it the body is there but you don't see the murder right and right. now it's now how do we solve the murder right mm-hmm. so it's like in a similar fashion there are things that happen in fantasy in cozy fantasy that are off screen because mm-hmm. they're actually not as important to the story you're trying to tell but the fantasy is the structure right mm-hmm. of the story and then i'm doing sweet romance on top of it so that's mm-hmm. why sometimes I go sweet and cozy or that's right. why I go cozy romanticy because I'm mm-hmm. trying to indicate to people the actual main thread is the romance uh, okay uh-huh. Uh-huh. and then the ghosts like right now the ghosts are not part of the romance they're the external factor that caused the romance and brings tension to the romance okay so that's also I think an important distinction that I'm trying to help people understand. Right. Yeah. So what's the difference between paranormal cozy and cozy fantasy? I would say that paranormal cozy is probably a subset of cozy fantasy because uh, paranormal mm. is going into the ghosts, yeah, the vampires, the werewolves, right. uh-huh. and they or, may or may or portal, or, portal, portal, which would a, be more fantasy. Yeah. Yes. I think a portal. Yes. You could have a portal fantasy. Um, where you're you're leaving the known world and hopping into this other world and so that Uh port and again I think this is all about what's that underlying framework that your story Uh is sitting on so if it's a portal fantasy then you already know you have to establish the normal world right think of Alice in Wonderland what's the normal Uh world right now the journey to the new world Uh now you have to explore the new world and understand the rules of that world and then how does this character react to those rules and how do they then contribute and then do they come back to mm-hmm. the normal world? And right. is that the journey? Or are they going to stay? Because mm-hmm. that's a different journey. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think those things, again, like fantasy is such a huge genre. And Correct. then the cozy part, I think, is all about what's the vibe throughout yeah. that book? And how does the reader feel? I think cozy is very focused on how are you making the reader feel? Yeah. 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 yeah I agree with that. And I think this is so interesting because like when we both started writing years ago, like there was like these big genres, you know, mystery, thriller, romance, fantasy. And one thing I've seen in the mystery world is everything's starting to get more and more specific and more fractured. So like, Mm -hmm. if you like cozy mysteries that are travel set in Europe, you can do that now, (laughs) you know? And so this is like a new to me, because I'm not as familiar with like the paranormal and the fantasy. This is like a new way of thinking about this a new way of splitting it out i guess yeah. that yeah. will help readers find exactly what they're looking for yeah. which is very cool and yeah. it makes me think i better start mentioning cozy mystery because in my mind cozy just means cozy mystery but right. now other readers are going to think oh that's a that's what i'm looking for and maybe they're looking for paranormal fantasy elements right. and i'm not going to have that in mind so they wouldn't want mine right. so it's just all very interesting it okay. is yeah. Well, so um, let's talk about your subscription, um, yeah. kind of change gears a little bit, because that's how I found you. I saw your Ream profile and I just yeah. thought it was so, just so well done. I love the artwork and I loved your tears. So can you talk to us a little bit of how you set that up and um, how you're introducing it to your readers, kind of like your second go around with subscription, right? Because you yes. said you'd done a Patreon. Yes. So Yes. So I think the important thing to know for this platform in particular, Ream Stories, the way I think of it is half Patreon, half Wattpad. Mm -hmm. The thing that I struggle with Patreon was if I wanted to do updates, and again, this was probably back in 2017, and I know things have changed since then, but I couldn't group my content. So if I wanted to release chapters, it was just going to be in the feed. Yeah. Whereas with Ream Stories, reamstories.com, I think is where you would go. Yeah. 
you have the ability to say, I'm publishing a story and I'm publishing chapters of a story on this schedule. And you could have multiple stories running at once, all on different schedules. Right. And then you have the community built in. And so at first I actually had more tiers. I was part of their beta run, uh-huh. um, which was, I think, very helpful for both sides because I am, you know, I do have a background in computer engineering. My day job is user experience design. So there were things that I was catching on just like, hey, as we're integrating with your Stripe, like this isn't working and we need to work on the instructions for this, you know? Right. Um, but I actually had, I think, three tiers. So I had a $5, a $10 and a $20. Um, and the more I looked at it again, with that, that lens of fun, but efficient, <laughs> I don't have, I don't have time to support three tiers. And yeah. honestly, I don't think I want a ton of people in my top tier either. Yeah. Cause yeah. I don't want that. I don't want to feel beholden or obligated. I right. want it to be fun. So right. my top tier. So I, I basically kept the top and the bottom tiers. Mm -hmm. So the top tier is my $20 tier. I call that the sponsor tier Mm -hmm. and they're going to get, as I release them, you know, when I, if I have, whenever get a book box together, they're going to get the book box for free. Right. Mm -hmm. Or they're always going to get like 15% off of my direct store. Right. Um, They're going to get free shipping from my store always. Right. right? As long as you're in one of the 55 countries where I can do that. Um, because I use pirate ship and they have a simple export rate where you can just have a flat rate for things based yeah. on the weight of things. Uh, so I limited the the $20 tier to five people. It's like, oh. I think, I think I could support five people. Right. And honestly, more than that felt to me, I was like, I don't know, do I need I, that felt greedy? And maybe yeah. that's me just, uh, you know, limiting myself. Right. But I also just thought like, I think I could, I could package like five care packages a year Mm -hmm. and I could do that, you know, that's sustainable for me. And then I kept the $5 tier and I call that the beta reader tier. Mm -hmm. And that tier is where you can, you get the early access to chapters. That's where you'll see character art. And it basically is like my private blog and private community. Mm. And I did this because I was actually following, um, I think her name is Kimberly Lemming. Uh, She has, (laughs) she has this very fun, spicy books. Um, but it's like, you know, that, that time I got drunk and saved a demon is like the title of one of her books. (laughs) And and like, that's, that sets the tone, right? Yeah. Right. That's perfect. perfect. (laughs) Yeah. And so I looked at her Patreon and she just has one $5 tier. And she even says in that tier, she's like, I don't have time or energy. Mm -hmm. I just want to make this fun for you guys. And so we're just going to do one tier. And I just loved that thought of, yeah, this is, this is because the reader wants to be closer to me. And, you know, I used to be a, a, a um, I used to be a, 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 I used to blog a lot, right? Yeah. I thought, you yeah. know, blogging was the, was the thing back in 2010. Mm-hmm. That's how you did anything. And now I feel like the only one who's going to, the only people who are going to look at your blog are the people who care and know yeah. you. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Now my blog is in my it's in my room. It's in my patron community. And so they're seeing things like they're seeing my sketches of my upcoming illustrated hardcover. Right. Right. And, and they're commenting on the next book right now. They are the only ones who get to see other than my editor, you know, they're the ones who are commenting along the way. And I'm, I'm getting that feedback of, okay, I'm hitting the tone right this time. And I've really cleaned up my act and I I can tell (laughs) because of the comments that are coming through. And the fact that a character who was kind of annoying in the first book, he's now the romantic hero in this book. And at one point I had this comment. It was like, you're making me like Jasper. Oh, there you go. I can't believe you're making me like Jasper. And I'm like, oh, okay. I did it. Okay, cool. You know, it's like, ah, tingles. Um, so yeah, so that's uh I think that's really been the focus again of even my my private community is yeah. the community access. So mm-hmm. I'd like to build a community around cozy Victorian fantasy. Right. I want to give people early access to chapters because I'm already writing. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And so I might as well get the feedback from people. And then they're getting that added benefit of there's part of us, they're part of a special community. Right. They're seeing content early. Yeah. Anyone who is um in 
the community at the time of publication will go into the acknowledgement section of the book. And that's something because I had done a Kickstarter with Haunting Mr. Atwood in 2010. That's the other thing. I did a Kickstarter in 2010. <laughs> you know, wow. and I feel like you are an are early talking. adopter or adapt, <laughs> and I, adopter. Yeah, yeah, I never, I never, I don't see myself as an early adopter, but I now I, I think I, I realize I am. You yeah. know, um, a little because bit again, sounds like it. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm hearing all these podcasts of oh yeah, people are starting, and of course with Brandon Sanderson, like he took it yeah. to a place. Yeah, um, but. But like even no. Reem, I mean, yeah, yeah, people aren't doing Reem. I mean, people are starting to do Reem, but mm-hmm. it's new, and you were yeah. you were on yeah. their their first kind of beta team sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, which by the way, we did an interview with Amelia and Michael, the creators yeah. of Reem, and great. can we put that in yeah, the show yeah. notes? We'll yeah, links. yeah, we'll put a okay. link to that. Yeah, if yeah, you're okay. curious about it and want more information on it, so they are fantastic. So you're. I had a couple of questions about the subscription before yes. we leave that topic. Yeah. So yeah. how did you introduce it to your readers? Did you have like some people, you know, they just launch it and they're like, Hey, it's there. Other people have like a very specific plan. So I'm just curious how you launched it. I feel like I did a combination of okay. both of those things. <laughs> uh, so I talked it up a little bit on my Instagram where, you know, I, but I, but I couched it with, Hey, I'm working on a short story. That's going to be a teaser into the next book. Mm -hmm. If you want to read this before anyone else join my community, they're reading chapters now. Mm -hmm. So I put it around the sort of light event. So the event was not the community. The event was the content within the community. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, there's this woman, she is, I, I love her to death. She, like, she found me, she was my first direct sale. She was my first patron mm-hmm. on Ream. Um, she's just so supportive. Um, and again, like, I will say I'm small, right? I have two patrons right now, right. but that's more than I've ever had before. Right. So taking it as a win, right? Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. feel like the slow build is much more manageable because for instance, I learned the hard way. I realized I had numbered chapters like 12 through 36, but I hadn't numbered chapters one through 11. So I added the number to the chapter title and wiped all my patrons' comments. Oh, no. (laughs) Because the platform's new. Now I sent a note to to Lamelia and Michael and I was sort of like, oh my gosh, I'm so dumb. Uh, I kind of assumed this was like Google Docs or yeah. Word, and clearly it's not. Do you have like a version history? And they're all like, no. Uh, We're like the other, you know. So, so the other subscription platforms like Wattpad and yeah. mm-hmm. you know, Railroad. I, you know, I wasn't experienced with those, and they were like, we totally understand your intuition. We're really sorry. Luckily, it was only the first third of the book, and yeah. I had already taken notes on everything. So, oh, that's good. You know, and I was able, and I was able to go into the Ream community and yes. say, guys, I did a newbie mistake. <laughs> please don't hate me. Like, yeah. please continue making comments. I will never do that again. But also, they are working on a fix so that doesn't happen to yeah. other yeah. authors as well. Right. Um, but. The fact that I can even do that, you know, yeah. like sending mm-hmm. a note to yeah. the readers and saying, right. hey, look, <laughs> I made a mistake, yeah. uh, but we're all going to live and grow through this. Yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah. We've all had things like that happen. So, yes. Yeah. 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 And, and you're right. When your community is smaller, it's easier to manage whatever you're doing. And I think you're really smart to limit your mm-hmm. tiers until you figure out, you know, how much you can handle. Right. I think that's really smart. and. Uh, something that a lot of us don't think about like no we the, just do yeah yeah subscriptions are kind of a slow build normally like like they're gonna it's not gonna be like like your kickstarter you want it to like launch yes. because it's gonna end but your subscription hopefully is gonna just be like a long slow Sustained. maybe up and down yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah 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 because we don't think about it because it, you know like me i'm like i the thought of creating more content for me, especially right now, is so terrifying and on a big scale that would just be, oh, I would feel so obligated. But, it, you know, I mean, if you start slow and you just bit, then you still have to fulfill those obligations, but it's not like you have 100 people or 50 people right. that are waiting for your staff. You've got two people or whatever, yeah. 
or 10 people, which is a lot better. So yeah, I I think think that's so smart. I really wanted to, so my day job is about user experience design, right? And user experience design is about mapping mental models and having the system support what your user already thinks or knows or understands. And if your system has to teach something different, then you need to provide wayfinding. Okay. You need to go from here to here. And I'm going to walk you through with breadcrumbs and this and that and the other. So I think that's too, where I'm applying those techniques and methods and just methodology to Uh this. So I wanted to set up the expectation right away. When I have a story Mm -hmm. that is 80% done, then Mm -hmm. I feel comfortable releasing chapters to you guys. Yeah. If I don't have a story that's 80% done, Mm -hmm. this is going to be an ad hoc community. You're going to get private blog posts. You're going (laughs) to get, I'm, I'm a mom. So like, there's going to be times where maybe I'm quiet. That doesn't mean you guys have to be quiet. It's a community. You can be talking with each other. Um, So I really wanted to set that up. And I I was kind of nervous about that, right? Like anytime you set up a boundary or try to set an expectation, you're putting yourself out there for someone to be like, I don't like that. Right. And, and I think that's where, especially because this is paid, Mm -hmm. that's fine. It's your money. I don't want to take your money if you don't want to give it to me. Right. Right. This is, but this is a mutual thing. I'm putting Mm -hmm. this stuff out there. If you love it, I'd love to have you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if it's not for you. I love that too, because yeah. we need that self-awareness. <laughs> right, right. Go find what yeah. is for you. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, exactly. Yeah, So I tried yeah. to be very upfront in my description. And actually, I did my, my description in my community was much longer. It was like five or six paragraphs. Uh-huh. And then I just kept tightening it and tightening it again. Like, I, you know, I put it through pro writing aid yeah. and it was just sort of like, this needs to be as tight and succinct and to the point as possible because yeah. people have demands on their time. I know because yeah. I right. do too. So yeah. what is the benefit? Why would you want to be here? Mm-hmm. And if it's not enough, that's fine. Like mm-hmm. I can't give refunds, but I, you can always cancel whenever you yeah. want, you yeah. know? Right. Yeah. Um, and if you want to come back, you can come back. Like this is not... You know, it's like it, hop on the discord and hop back off again. You know, it's right. not, mm-hmm. this is, this is not a contract between us right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. other than the fact that I would like to continue making content and right. this, I feel like this gives me inspiration for that, where I can do that. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I think you set it up in a way where like, it's very similar to what I think I will try and do is like, if I have content, I'm happy to share it with you. But I don't like that pressure of how some people do a chapter a week or whatever. And I just can't handle that. Like I would not be able to write, but like setting it up, setting the expectation that if I have something and it's mostly done, then I'll share it. I think that's really a good way and a a new way that we haven't heard a lot of people talking about doing. Mm, So thank you for sharing. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Exactly. Well, let's uh, talk about your uh, all-in-one planner uh, for discovery riders. Tell us what that's about, where we can find it, all that yes. stuff. So I have a website, it's called brightbirdpress.com. Uh-huh. And so bright bird press is actually my publishing imprint, right? Okay. So all yeah. my, all my stories are published through that. And then, you know, I'm always on the hunt for like the perfect journal but yeah. because I'm high intellection, there will never be a perfect journal. <laughs> but the all-in-one planner, I feel like got me pretty close. And actually yeah. that planner is a combination of six other journals that I made. Mm-hmm. Okay. I started my Etsy in like 27. Well, so I had an Etsy in 2012. That one bombed. I rebranded in 2017. Because I found, again, I found the thing I love to do. I love making journals. I love sitting in my like affinity publisher and making page layouts and figuring stuff out. So the all-in-one planner is a combination of my original novel journal, which was basically taking the concepts that I love from bullet journaling, which is get it out of your brain and get it onto a thing mm-hmm. and then prioritize the the things, the list, right? right. That's if you want to go learn more about bullet journals, go, go find writer, writer Carol on YouTube. He has an amazing, like five to 10 minute video 
what we see now is bullet journaling is actually like creative journaling, right? Where we have the stickers and the washi tape and the the markers. And that feels, I feel like that puts a lot of pressure on people yeah. where the actual core concept of bullet journaling is really get everything out of your brain, get it onto a piece of paper. What do you have to do today? What do you need to just put in the future bucket? Um, and it's a very, it's meant to be a very fast prioritization technique. And, and then you have the collections, which are basically your brain dumps, your themed brain dumps. So what I did is I took the themed brain dumps and put that at the front of the journal. And then I just left the back half blank. And that was the first mm. novel journal where it's like, what are like, what are comparative titles that your readers, and it was all again, like as a writer, what are the titles that you like? Who are the authors that you write? Like, or you're trying to emulate, um, what's your setting? Who are your characters? What are their relationships? And it would, they were just pages for brain dumps. Mm -hmm. And then I added a uh, variation that had a monthly tracker. So then on the monthly tracker spreads, you have 12 spreads and you have just, you know, a, a list down the page. What days did you edit? What days did you write? What days did you do social marketing? What days did you write? And so it's just more of the admin type stuff. Then I started getting commentary or questions on, well, but this is great, but like, how do you, how, I want this tied together. I don't just want the monthly tracker and the brainstorming. I'm trying to do NaNoWriMo. So mm -hmm. National Novel Writing Month, you have this set goal. I have 30 days. I have to get 50,000 words. Mm -hmm. So then I created a variation for that where this, you had the brainstorm spreads and then you had these daily spreads. What's your start writing count? What's your target? What did you actually do? What are the three questions that you had from yesterday that you need to answer today? What are some notes that you have so when you go in tomorrow? And so I pulled all that together into one big journal and it's, she's a beast. It's, it's two pounds. <laughs> it's a two pound journal. It's the size of the hap, the classic happy planner. So it's like, it's, I think it's seven and a half by nine and a half spiral bound. Um, but that journal lets you track two projects. So you get all the benefit of the brainstorm spreads for two projects. Then you also get, cause it's meant to be for a year and it's undated because I don't like the pressure of, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't write on the 15th. So now I got to go do something on the 16th. Right, so right. Life happened and now we're in the next month and now I have all these wasted pages. Yeah. Right. There are no dates in any of my journals. <laughs> um, for that reason, because I don't like the pressure myself. And so then in this all-in-one planner, we actually have a, how is your year starting? And what are, what is your reflection from last year? And so that's how the journal starts, but your, your, your year could start in August, right? You could go yeah. August to July or if you want. Yeah. Um, and so, so you can, you can reflect on your year. You can have, uh, this is my goal for the year. Do I want to finish a book? Do I want to do X number of words? What is it that you want to do? Then you have two projects that you can track and where it's the full spread, the full spread of brainstorming topics. Plus then also there's a section for a monthly challenge. So it doesn't matter what month you get to choose the month, but you have 30 days of daily uh, sort of spreads that you can work with. And then I take your, your year goal and I have quarterly spreads and month, month, week spreads. Okay. So what's your quarterly goal? And I also have a quarterly self-care for writers page. So it's sort of like a bingo page. <laughs> you know, did you go outside this quarter? Did you do this? Did you do that? <laughs> so you have this bingo for the quarter. And then you break down the quarterly goal into, a, into the monthly spread. What's your mantra for the month? Right. Again, undated. And then you have weekly spreads and the weekly spreads are where it's like, what's your personal goal? What's your work goal? And what's your writing goal this week? So it's meant to be. So you have one planner. You don't need a personal planner and a work planner. You have everything together. And so that way you're more likely, I hope, to keep up with your writing because you're giving it the same priority as your personal, like your home goals and your work goals. Right. Yeah. So. Wow. It sounds really flexible, but like... Like if you like super detailed, you could use that. But if you want like the higher viewpoint, you know, where you only look at like the monthly calendar or whatever, it sounds like you could do any of that. Yeah. So very cool. I hadn't heard yeah. of it and I can't wait to go look at them. <laughs> yeah. 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 And actually, I think I'm asking my, uh, 
newsletter. So the, so the thing about going direct too is so like Shopify uh, can take your customer, will we'll basically port your customers into, I use MailerLite for my newsletter mm-hmm. and I'm able to know like who bought from a store versus who came in from something else. And I am doing the same thing with my Brightbird Press. So my Brightbird Press, um, my Shopify is hooked up to my Etsy. So everyone who bought through my Etsy, I can make sure like, hey guys, I'm going to release new covers for these journals soon because I've had the same covers for like two and a half years. So, hey mm-hmm. guys, like, what do you want? Yeah. Do you want this cover? Do you want that cover? Do you yeah. want something different? Like, tell me how to support you guys. That's that's my goal. Yeah. I just want to support you. Yeah. I yeah. feel like, you know, I, I hand package all the stationery, um, all my, my write my fiction is all, um, print on demand because I just don't want to mm-hmm. carry that inventory, but mm-hmm. for the writing stationery, these are like writer care packages to friends. I just don't know. Right. Like yeah. that's how I treat, treat this. Yeah. Um, that's great. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, you're amazing. I mean, yes. after talking to you, I'm like, wow, I'm so exhausted. You do all this <laughs> and work full time. I'm and like, and have little kids. Yes. So. <laughs> I mean, I don't really sleep, but uh, I need sleep. I've, <laughs> I've been an insomniac my entire life. So at this point, I'm just taking advantage of it. <laughs> Make it work for you. Well, this has been great. So we always like to ask everybody, what's the best thing you think you've done to set yourself up for success? I think the best thing that I've done to set myself up for success is really finding my healthy boundaries. Uh, yeah, that's really, I think it's completely changed my focus. It's changed. It's even changed my relationship and talking like with my husband about it of, Hey, I need Saturday morning. I'm going to go leave for three hours. I'm going to work at the library or a coffee shop. Um, can you like, are you good with the kids, you know, Mm -hmm. and giving myself that permission because I am not good at that. I'm not good at leaving the house. I'm not good at leaving the kids. Mm -hmm. And, but I can also tell Like if I'm not keeping that boundary for myself, I start acting unhealthy in just little ways, right? Um, I'm not drinking enough water. I'm not, you know, I'm not leaving my desk. I'm, (laughs) I'm, I'm not giving the kids space so they get to bond with dad because mom is always around, you know? So I think that has been the biggest change for me is giving myself the permission to make a boundary, stick with it, and then see the benefits of it. Because creating a boundary takes a long time time to see the benefits. Yeah. And that has been a journey in and of itself. Um, cause you know, there are times where it's like, I don't want to, this is just causing more strife. Like this isn't helping right. anything. I'm just going right. to, right. but then it's like, no, no, stick with the boundary and like, see it through. Like you need to do it for at least like six weeks before you, you try to change something and see what actually is coming out of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. Well, tell everybody where they can find you, Belinda, and all your great stuff. Well, thank you. So uh, you can find my website at wordarella.com. So think Cinderella, but with words. (laughs) And that is also my social handle just about everywhere else. I'm mostly on Instagram. So Uh if you're going to want to really find me, go to Instagram, find wordarella, W-O-R-D-E-R-E-L-L-A. Right. Um, and that's, I know it's like, whenever you spell out loud, you're like, oh no, am I going to do this right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's my website and my Instagram. And those are the best places to find me. Awesome. awesome. Perfect. Okay. Well, we will have links to those in the show notes. So thank you for coming in on talking to us today. Thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast and Adria Williams for doing the admin. And thanks to our sponsor, Vellum. Um, yep. Don't forget about them. So we'll see you everybody next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.